you'll probably all agree it's been very educational so far. Hopefully we'll have a bit of fun with this too. Uh, we've got some really great guests. Uh, this is Graham Nixon here and also his artist Winston McCall, who you probably know from Parkway Drive, and uh, Thelma Plum and Leander Souza, who's also her manager. Uh, ever since the beginning of time, people have been making music and roughly five seconds after that, someone realised that old people aren't very marketable. As such, we look to the young with a vampiric sense of jealousy and rage, hoping to crack the secrets of their eternal freshness. How do they always manage to be cooler than us, despite being laughably unable to manage their own lives? How can we steal their potential and then potentially use it to crush them? <laughs> to answer these and many more music-focused questions, we here at Music New South Wales and Indent have invited two young, upwardly mobile musicians, well, young, one young one and the other one's sort of like on his way out, I guess, um, to discuss the secret. <laughs> to breaking your act here and overseas. Uh, let's get started with Thelma. So hailing from Brisbane, Queensland, Thelma Plum is a 21-year-old singer-songwriter in the folk tradition. In 2011, after being inspired by local musicians and her high school principal, Thelma took up music and eventually placed the song on Triple J's Unearthed competition. Although she uploaded the song, Father Said, in the closing minutes of the competition, Plum ended up winning the National Indigenous Music Award uh, in that section of the competition and since then she's supported Elvis Costello, which I think we can agree is pretty enormous, played countless regional focus festivals and worked with high profile Australian producers like M Phases and Tony Buchan while recording her upcoming EP Rosie. She's active on Instagram and Facebook and she doesn't shy away from growing her grassroots fan base online simultaneous to making appearances in taste making media like Yen and Frankie. Please make her feel welcome. Thumb upon. So uh, we're just going to start with some general questions and Great. stuff. Uh, what got you started in music and how would you characterise your approach to songwriting? Um, okay, what got me started... So this thing is so... it's so weird. <laughs> Can um, we get some fallback? <laughs> yeah. Up here. It's cool. Um, okay, what got me started in music? I don't know. It, I guess it's just, I think, like a lot of people that are in music, it's kind of always just been a part of my life. Um, I can't really remember a time when I, you know, wasn't... Um, doing music or singing or listening to music or... Um, so I guess it, it was very... Yeah, I guess it came, it just happened. And so... Um, but I suppose getting into m the music industry was more... Um, when I was in high school and, um, and, I, w and I, w I went to a really cool high school. It was called Music Industry College, which was um, a school pretty much for, I don't know, naughty kids who didn't like... Uh, I, I guess normal schools which um, I didn't do too well in um, so it was great everything was kind of based around music and I met um, a lot of a lot of really cool people like my manager Leanne when I went there um, and yeah I don't know I guess um, so I just was every day I'd finish school and if I went to school um, that day I would uh, uh, go home and play music and then play I'd be playing gigs during the week and just I guess always doing music. kind of a music. natural progression. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. But that's a fairly different approach to at least going out and just Winston laughing a little, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But I guess some people feel a little bit outside of the norm in terms of their interest in the arts and have to look outside the schooling system to find those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Do a lot of things outside. They don't often have that support within the school. No. Um, and it's, it can be a bit daunting, and I can imagine anyone here who's thinking about a career in the arts but not doing that well at school, which is certainly something that happened to me. Um, it'd be nice to know that there were alternatives or places you could go to do that. Yeah, I think um, I know before, because I went to this school, it was like it, for year 11 and 12, it was, um, but before that I went to um, just, I, I went to lots of high schools. Um, yeah. Was so <laughs> expelled a lot? For yeah, just was so naughty. No, I just, um, I don't know. I just I just moved around a bit and um and couldn't really find where I fit in until I went to this music school. But um yeah, the school I went before that I remember like um I wasn't like I got rejected from the choir and um you know there was lots of things that in the school the music program was just not at all didn't really cater to um any other music apart from what they were you know playing us or showing us and um yeah which was a bit. How come you got booted from the choir? That seems weird. I don't know. You know what? It was probably more to do... I don't know. I just... She I, she just didn't like me, my music teacher. And um, I... Yeah, I don't know. She was... It's very, it was very, like, classical. 
everyone was, you know, I guess quite, I don't know, I, she just didn't. But you know what, I played a show last year and she was in the audience and it made me pretty happy. I was just like... <laughs> That's yeah. the thing, did you can pay? just take revenge on everyone. She, did she pay? She, she did, she really paid healthy. to go as well, so I was like... <laughs> no um, guest list for you. Yeah, no, and <laughs> I remember fun. just looking and being like, you know what, fuck you, I didn't want to be in your choir <laughs> anyway. You heard it here first, let's have a bit more of that, yeah. I reckon. Um, so, progressing from school into kind of that weird grey area where you like know what you want to do but you haven't got any legitimate kind of mm -hmm. backing yet can be difficult but you know you won a <laughs> section of unearth so I did that can really kickstart people's careers Amazing. and I think everybody here probably knows about that as an option um, how did that help how did you go about doing that and then what was the result of that okay well um, I think it was actually kind of I I put my song on unearth which was father said which was just a a little demo. I actually put it on Unearth because I was trying to uh, show my grandma my music and she didn't understand Dropbox or like email and so, yeah. and so I was like I'll put it on here and, um, and she'll be able to listen to it and um, so it was just a demo. I recorded that song in my cupboard um, and it was I guess fun and, and then you know people started commenting on it which was really exciting and I found out about this competition um, to play for specifically for Aboriginal artists to play at um, the NEMA Awards in um, Darwin, and so I was like, I may as well enter this for fun, and you know, and not for just fun because I wanted to, I wanted to win it, um, but yeah, and then I guess I got to do that, which was really I was really lucky that um, to have that happen, and that kind of opened a lot of doors for me. But I think yeah, now just like everyone in this room that I guess plays music should be on Unearthed. I think um, I hope you all are, but um. Yeah, it's just... Fair enough. I yeah. think what we're kind of talking about is pathway, like finding pathways to things that are going to work for you when there isn't any real structure around what you want to do, you know what I mean? Like you can get out and play a lot of shows and that works for certain... I mean, Parkway have probably played more shows than most bands you can think of. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that seems like a completely legitimate route to success yeah. also. Um, but it, it's about finding what works for the act probably and what's going to be best totally. marketing you. I mean, Blue Juice won some regional competitions that then gave us money to record, which meant that we had product to then send to radio. So it's a lot of different things that you can do, I guess, but it has to work for the band. Um, you know, you've also, and on the, on the subject of publicity, you've managed to get some exposure via cultural influential publications like Yen and Frankie, which is a good opportunity to build crowd from a grassroots touring perspective and at the same time a top-down sort of marketing yeah. thing. Um, how did that come about and how did you manage those? Like the Frankie and Yen thing? Do you want me to talk about yeah, that? If, you, if I'm you've like got stuff to talk about, oh, everyone yeah. should feel comfortable to talk about I whatever. Um, you know, and I think I'd, to take it one step, you know, I met Thelma when she was 14, 15 in high school. So mm. a big part of us is developing a relationship over a few years and really getting to know Thelma and her music and what she wanted to do and all that kind of stuff. So through that, realised, you know, um, can I say I think she's 19, not 21? Yeah. Oh, pardon me. Mm -hmm. But so, you know, starting with a 17-year-old, so yeah. things like the audience of Frankie and Yen is Thelma. I right. mean, that is her. So we look for really, you know, true ways to get the way that, well, those people and those fans are people like Thelma and her fans, friends, so it works, rather than do things that don't fit together. Sure. So, so then it was about, you know, the relationships and taking some time and not wait, you know, waiting. So you're it's not like trying right to service thing. her music to Triple M or anything, it's not <laughs> yeah. like... No, we've been really, you know, grade 11 economics, supply and demand. Mm. I don't, we don't put Thelma anywhere until there's a demand, and whether that's the media or the fans or shows or whatever. It's a about, you know, having a long-term plan, not just, yay, let's do everything now. Yeah, and not mm. trying to exhaust resources that Absolutely. you might not have at the early stage of your career doing things that are going to be pointless, which mm. I guess managers have a pretty good idea about, but artists might also, if they've been touring a lot then after a while you might once and get to see a show you know isn't going to work or it was just mm. it was just answering this just before um, right. which was how many shows do we play when we first started and it was literally our start as a band was just play shows when we got a chance to play a show mm -hmm. and that was about once a fortnight maybe and there's only a limit that you can do in Australia before you run out and the demand becomes exhausted because you've given them everything. You can't completely like play a uh, Australian tour once a month and give them the same songs and expect to have time to write new music so your set isn't stale and still expect people to want to come to your gig and be excited in the same way they were the first time they saw you. So 
it's it's one of those things. Yeah, it's supply kind of and demand. changed a little though, hasn't it? I mean, it you... has. It, it has a bit, but at the same time, it's um, attention spans have become that much shorter, mm. um, and access to international bands has become that much greater. So, while an, um, having a lot of pride in a, a local band still exists, um, it's still people have the ability to move on to that band that might be that shining star from overseas that they've always wanted to see and spend their money seeing that band rather than supporting the local bands that they yeah that they have growing in their own area Sorry. which is understandable because you don't want to see the same thing that you've seen over and over again but at the same time when we started out that was all we had access to <laughs> yeah the only the only bands that we got to see from overseas were the bands that Graham was bringing out mm -hmm. so yeah. <laughs> Graham, Graham works for Resist Records, so people know. But we will talk uh, at length about Parkway building a, a local following here, which is obviously integral to their success in general and gave them a launch pad to become an internationally successful band also. Um, we'll just continue to chat a bit about Thelma's background and then move into that area pretty shortly. Uh, in terms of like marketing yourself in magazines, which is a very different world, to marketing yourself to a live audience where you're directly interacting with yeah. an audience and you can kind of see how people are reacting. How do you balance the expectations of being a, a kind of, um, you know, a burgeoning star mm -hmm. who's talking about their, or trying to market themselves in, the, in terms of the way they look and, and in a magazine that might be very fashion conscious to just being a regular person who's doing a gig? Like, is that challenging to find Like, some do you mean like a balance between them? Yeah, like yeah. how do you be supporting Elvis Costello and being in a magazine and then doing a show which might not be a thousand cap room. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's tricky to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, it is a tricky to do that. I don't know. I guess... Um, I don't know. Only answer questions about music. Yeah, okay. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's not what I mean, Jake, at all. Yeah. But I, that when it comes to magazines, that's yeah. partly... Thelma would prefer to talk to them about... It's about right, music right. and talk about. what musicians she loves and songwriting and that than talk about the latest shoes, although they might like yeah, to yeah. take yeah. a photo of the shoes, but, you know, it's trying to keep balance, I suppose. It is tricky because people, as soon as they start doing those things, as soon as you're getting styled for photo shoots and stuff, yeah, they do want, kind of want to make you into that thing where you might have an opinion on things that aren't necessarily within your I mean, spectrum of I interest. Guess you know. I have a lot of control over that too. Like yeah, we, I, yeah. Yeah, I don't really, I think it's, I think it's cool, like, Sure, if you want to give me free shoes, I'm I'm down with that. But um, but me I too. yeah, but um, but I definitely think it's quite important to me and who I am. I, you know, kind of only ever shop at op shops, and you know, I, mm. I believe I have certain beliefs in what I think about clothes and being ethically made. And I know that a lot of the time. Um, and we that's talk not a lot. And we keep a lot of there's you know there's a team of people we work with, but when it comes to photos and images and say what yes or no, that's really comes to Thelma right. mm. first. And then I, you know, what she wants, I make damn well happen. So it's not like we're being imposed of a whole bunch of stuff, no, no, which is kind of reverse. So that's that control stuff, isn't it? Mm. So With a band like Pathway... Which is hard. It, it is tricky when you're, when you're being asked those questions up front and you don't... And it's not like you've consciously created this brand yet. No. So you don't really know what the answer to those questions is necessarily until they've been practice. You might make a couple of mistakes with it. I mean, Parkway have gotten the opportunity to do it for a long time, but well, the, it's weird hearing the very similar parallels, and also it seems like the importance that of we've always kind of thought was very important was control mm -hmm. yeah. and controlling as much as you can of mm -hmm. what you create and who you are, because as soon as someone you have someone telling you what to do in any way, shape or form, you lose that. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing for us again was like, we, we weren't in fashion mags or anything like that, but we, we were in metal magazines mm. and we're not metal heads. So mm -hmm. we've, we, it's, it's really odd being like the magazines we read, surfing magazines. And then you get asked a whole bunch of questions, literally trying to push you into that mm. direction mm. and we have no idea how to answer them yeah, and yeah. at the same time it either makes you look like uh, someone that's completely out of place for the wrong reason or someone that has a zero knowledge about a subject that they really should have knowledge on. So, so is it good to yeah. come to those processes with some as a young artist, would it, do you think it would be helpful to come to those opportunities with a bit of a plan or something? I think it definitely is, like it's, it's one of those things that's become easier 
as time goes on right. to realize that there are questions that people are going to ask you. Like if you are playing a certain type of music, if you look a certain way, everything counts uh, with what you do. People aren't just looking at you and seeing exactly what you think you're portraying. Mm -hmm. They're taking you in their own specific way and they can mm -hmm. ask anything in the world of mm -hmm. you. And as soon as you stumble, um, it's not necessarily like a massive problem, but that is something that's going to be remembered and they're going to, they're going to take note. People take note of absolutely everything you're talking about, the instant age where mm -hmm. like every little character counts. You can, you can say something that's going to be listened to by a million people in however many characters on Twitter. So Just one thing yeah. is young people, you've got to know who you are. So the artist has to know who you are in order for them to yeah. report on that. So if you don't know who you are and you're trying, they'll automatically make assumptions and put you in a box that suits That's it. One genre or age so or race or whatever. Yeah. That's true. I, I, I kind of think that's a scary thing because most of the time, you know, Josh was saying before and Wayne was saying before, it takes a little bit of time for things to develop. Like you don't really know what you're doing initially and, and it's kind of just happening organically. So, but people want to ask you really definitive questions about like your five favorite artists of all time. <laughs> yeah. and it's like, I don't know, you like everything. They're, things, they're the things that come back to haunt you as well. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. the right. thing you're gonna be branded with forever. Like you, you do your first interview ever and they say, what's your favorite band? And you say something and then from that point on, it's on a Wikipedia page. Seriously, blah, blah's though. favorite band is blah, blah. It's and nuts. that comes up yeah. in every interview and you can't backtrack on like that. Like 10 years later, someone will be like, so you guys are a hip hop band. I was like, our first yeah. two EPs. Yeah. 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 It's like, what are you talking? It's been ten <laughs> years. Yeah, exactly. Like, and people do don't listen. To and the internet is truth. Yeah, that's like, right. Like when you can wait, when you can type something in and the answer is straight there in front of you. And the you'll image take as that. well. I just remind yeah. the What's awful, the awful photo that they took oh, of you when you were under eighteen. Oh, 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 oh you got one of them too. Oh my god. So. <laughs> Photos live longer than words. This sometimes. is, I think, before I think this is before I really had you and I, we and I weren't working together. I and I just was like, I, it was for the Australian or the Korea Mail or something like that. And they, um, we did it. You can Google them. They're still on Google. It's I wish I didn't tell you that actually. <laughs> um, but they, we did a photo shoot, and the questions were just like I think, and it, and it was on the front cover, and the title of it was. Um, with this awful photo of me like this, looking like oh, 35 man. years old, looking, and I'm like, there's like flowers in the in my hair and in the background, and I'm kind of just sitting there like this. It was, um, yeah, it was really strange. And the headline was, um, I don't know, it was just, it was very pigeonholed and very mm. much like um, featured like Aboriginal young girl in it, which I was right on the with this great photo of me. Um, yeah, so that I guess is But it was this crap. classic, as a manager, you know, being under 18 and not giving permission for a major newspaper to take a photograph that then they can own and they can continue to and sell they use it all and the they, time. so the photographer makes some money off that photo to this day, then Thelma never got to approve it, see it, had no That's idea scary. what she was doing. Jeez. So be really careful. Yeah, you should. your photograph. Yeah, <laughs> be careful. And also can. Facebook is now easy to pull things off and use yeah. as well so but don't upload silly photos of you doing something on facebook that you don't want everyone to or see do. or do you know, or do but then you control it. <laughs> yeah it comes back to that control thing. you know what you're gonna do yeah. you know what I mean? everything um, has the ability to come back yeah, every single thing and i've only just Oof. like i only just started using instagram because i literally said there's only so much i want people to know about my Absolutely. life i don't want to be the person that like says here, this is everything of me. Expect the world from me. You know where I sleep. You know where I live. Yeah, yeah. And I recently started using it because I was like, actually, kids are interested in knowing some genuine facts about me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's an avenue. But at the same time, every single thing I'll put up there, I've got to think about the consequences yeah. of. And if you don't do that, that's the time. When mm -hmm. <laughs> Twitter's yeah. significant. If you fly into a drunken rage. Yeah. And then just 120 characters, some crazy racist shit or something. Yeah, mm. that we'll would put be it, bad put it, for you. Put it this way: so. like, how many how many jobs these days interview someone and will go on their Facebook page and look at the stuff and go, "I'm not giving you a job. You posted a drunken picture of you semi naked, passed out." Yeah, yeah. it works <laughs> like that tenfold for anyone that wants to be in any kind of spotlight. And being in a band is that exact <laughs> thing. But the other yeah. thing too with photo, with a lot of the media nowadays, it's um, all online. They can just rip stuff off Facebook at a really low DPI. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, say when magazines ruled, the only way to get high res images was from either the management or the label. Mm. So when we had all those images, 
no one was running bad photos because they couldn't source them. Whereas nowadays, yeah, if you can right click now. on anything and <laughs> save a Facebook Maybe they weren't image. even writing bad stories. No. Do you yes. know what I mean? Now it's kind of open slather. If you can do that, then you don't even really need anyone's permission to write anything. So yeah. it's possible mm -hmm. to just get a lot of press that's pretty crazy. Yeah. But I think people are starting to, I, I, don't know, I don't know what you guys think, but people might be filtering out what seems like crappy writing and crappy articles on bands because there's so much that you just kind of... I kind of doubt that, to be honest. Right. I reckon it's become, there's so much out there that people's mm. attention spans, they might not take it in, but you can skim over stuff so quickly and yeah. take it in and go, yep, yeah, that was written. That's it. In, like, mm. We haven't put out anything longer than 100, 120 words for right. summer, ever. Mm. Just because it, you want it to be able to be Less reprinted? Less content, or? and then it's the same, you know, it's very clear, it's limited, and it's, yeah. You're like and we can Plum, control the writing. 19 year old metalcore artist. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of which, uh, let's do a little bio for Winston since he's just there. Uh, <laughs> since forming his giant killing metalcore band Parkway Drive in Byron Bay in 2002, is that right? I don't know. Okay, good. Oh, I, I, let's go with I think that. it was three. I think, we're, yeah, I don't know. I'm saying two. Yeah. Winston McCall has toured Australia and the world virtually non stop. Parkway Drive started out small, hitting as many local halls and community events in their native Byron and surrounding areas as possible, and refining their crushing live show as they went. Their commitment to the loyal and supportive hardcore scene paid dividends. The band now spend the majority of their time playing large-scale club dates alongside huge international festivals like Vance Warped Tour in the US, metal-specific events like Graz Pop Festival in Europe and other massive ones like that, uh, and they've been signed by several influential labels, Resist Records, Sweden's Burning Heart, a personal favourite of mine, and the American imprint Epitaph. After four critically acclaimed and commercially applauded records, they're now recognised as a market-leading band, and they've even cracked the Billboard Top 100 in the US, which is nuts for a metalcore band. Uh, they, Parkway are, as we all know, in the elite of their genre worldwide, and it's not too bad for a guy who thought you would otherwise be a loser making coffee in Byron, to quote him. Yeah, bad coffee. <laughs> no. Bad coffee. I'm <laughs> sorry. Right. I only just found out what bad coffee is, and now I really regret ever making coffee before it. So I didn't yeah. realise that you were actually doing that. I just thought that you thought that that might happen. Um, the story of Parkway Drive represents a classic and David and Goliath model. Really, it's a mint condition example of how a local band can make good on a huge scale uh, with the right amount of, you know, energy and application, I suppose. And also, it has to be said, the support of a really, really loyal genre. It's a different kind of thing than just a pop thing. Um, it's almost so perfect, really, you can't even believe the details. So, Winston, you said you, you didn't enjoy high school in much the same way as Thelma sort of mentioned yeah. that she wasn't totally invested in the school yeah. bits. I'm not too good with... Um, I, love, I love learning. I'm not too good with the structure of specific mm. learning, so mm. that's where it didn't work for me. And I, I was no good at music. I'm still... Like, I'm, I've literally only just started learning music. I'm mm. taking singing lessons and slowly learning how to plonk away on a piano and I'm hopeless at that. But um, when it came to high school, yeah, it's, I, I took knowledge away and I'm definitely 100% I'm definitely advocate of going to school because only, I think only when you become an adult do you realise that there's so much ingrained in the learning process other than the facts they're telling you, such as communication, socialisation, mm -hmm. stuff like that, that you really need to, to do to learn how to s function in society and get anything out of it. Um, that I'm really grateful that I stuck it out. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I was not great at school. Fair <laughs> enough. That's okay, it didn't really matter too much because you kind of found... Got lucky. ...your calling. I don't know, like, <laughs> did you get lucky or did you kind of just naturally find mm -hmm. your niche that you were going to be... Here's the thing, it is, it's, it's a mix of both. Mm -hmm. um, we are under no illusion that this band in its form is a perfect storm of circumstance, hard work and personalities and help from friends as well. Um, we really love what we do, first and foremost, and we have this band started from us doing what we love, and that was the only goal, do what you love. It was never, you're gonna make a career out of this. That um, seems like a very important thing to say to anyone definitely who's doing is, it. Definitely is, and, and that's also, every interview I do, there's, what would you say to a <laughs> band that's just starting up and wants to make it huge? Everyone wants to know that secret. And the thing is, there is no secret. And, and Josh said it before, like you can, it. you can do covers and you can put it on YouTube and you might hit it big and it's like winning the lottery. But f for us, we never wanted to make it big and the secret for us was doing what we love because that's the success. Like the success for us was 
we wrote music that we loved doing, we challenged ourselves, and we achieved the goals that we had. And the goals at that point in time were literally just play a local gig, entertain your friends. And it made us feel so great. Yeah. And then when the opportunities came from then on, that's when the forks in the road begin and the consequences begin. And luckily for us, we seem to have managed to take way more good turns than we have bad and been able to deal with the bad and roll with the good. What and were some it. of the bad ones, if I can ask? Um, learning processes, basically. They're not, there's nothing major, but it took us a long time to learn about health, put it that way. Um, if you're a musician, you can't play music when you're sick. Mm. Or it's very, like, you can, but your show suffers and then reviews suffer and then so you're people, touring so much that people are getting sick on the road yeah and, really sick i yeah. got i got pneumonia like we the only times we've had more to, so in europe though right more so yeah. in europe yeah australia was a lot better but that was because we're on home turf but um at the same time it's so easy like we go on tour with a lot of young bands who just want to party every night yeah. just like we're on tour go mental like all of a sudden you're playing a gig where they're giving you a couple of hundred bucks and they're giving you a free case of beer, so may as well nail that case of beer now because you're going to get another one the next night. And after like the amount of bands that we've gone to tour with, that second night of tour, singers busted his voice. It was out the whole night last night screaming and then all of a sudden has no voice and the guitarist is singing. And it's, it's, it's really easy to fall into that trap of thinking you're completely invincible and the show goes on. It's just reflex. And if you're a drummer, we've, we've, we've figured it out. Like it's, our drummer can't hurt his hands or his feet. Our guitarist can play with as long as he has his arms and his fingers available. Like we've had a guitarist playing in two entire tours in a wheelchair. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can do pretty much anything as long as I can stand up and my voice goes and my, my vocals are open and no one really needs the bass player. So it's been... <laughs> it's been it's <laughs> pretty hard. <laughs> I don't... You know, I, I yeah. hate this, like, eternal ragging on the bass player. Yeah, it's no, horrible, he's, he's great, but... <laughs> He he's pretty big, he takes up some space on stage. But so just replace him, I guess, yeah. is what he's saying. Yeah, but there is those lines, like if you're playing instruments, there's certain things that you can't screw with, and why would you, like, there's no point in going out and getting a drunken fight if you're a guitarist and you need your fingers yeah, the true. next day. And there's no point in me going out and screaming at someone all night if I'm going to have to sing the next day. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> I think that's really, like, a reasonable thing to say that people don't understand once they get into the position whereby, as you say, they're getting free stuff and everyone's like, woo, you're awesome, let's do this. Yeah, man. that's it. And, so, and, it's, and, and when you have friends around as well, like the, the first time you get given free stuff backstage on a rider is amazing. We still have a photo of the free sandwiches we first got <laughs> at uh, Newcastle. Newcastle Uni was like, we got sandwiches, top of the hill here, we're not going any better. But um, <laughs> it's like, when it comes to wanting to take advantage of free stuff as well. Like, I'm saying take advantage of, as in use it. And you have friends come along and they see you get free alcohol or something that just yells, party, let's go. It's so easy to just go, yeah, let's it's go. It's usually the That's friends. It. It's always, yeah, yeah it's generally because, and, and it's so, I wouldn't say peer pressure, but it's so easy to go, yeah, they're just yes, here, man. let's do this. Well, they're like, oh yes, man, you should be living this rock and roll lifestyle. That's it, it's like, yeah. Uh, this is the rock and roll lifestyle. It's like yeah. not screwing myself up constantly yeah, everyone, to amuse you. That's it. Every, <laughs> everyone that comes backstage and sneaks backstage just wanted to say hi, and I'm sitting there in tracksuit pants sipping a tea, and they're like, oh, you must party so hard. You spent from last night. No, last night I did the exact same thing, except I went to bed an hour earlier as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yeah that is a deceptive kind of element of the industry. But it's, I, I don't think it's, there's, there's a time and a place, but it's just not yeah. on the second show. Could, no. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think it's probably worth talking to some degree about you guys building your audience. Because I remember seeing you in 2004 when I was working at the Annandale. And that was a ripper. Yeah, it was really good. I remember small record you, launch. You looked yeah. like Christian Bale in American Psycho. That's yeah. What I was like. <laughs> That's a really I nice description. I you beforehand and I was like, this guy's very calm. He's got very small paws on his face. And then you went on stage and you were like, oh, it, was <laughs> it was actually scary. Jumped I was like kids. scared in a good way. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but that obviously, that impact as a live show really sold that band in. Because I knew nothing about you that night. I was yep. just turning up to work to do the gig. And then, you know, at the end of that night, I was a fan. And that must have happened over and over and it feels like the hardcore scene would would have helped propel you guys and gotten you overseas and those kinds of things how did yep. those opportunities develop for us it um it was uh opportunities and i guess we're all competitive in the sense of um if we see 
something that we like and it was something that we wanted to I wouldn't say emulate, but we're like, that's really cool. Why don't, why don't we think of doing that? Um, we'd, we'd try and step it up a notch. Anything and in particular that's inspired well, you in that way? It started off with the music. Mm-hmm. We started off with the music that we'd, we'd, we'd been brought up on punk and hardcore bands, and we loved that, except we wanted to play something more technical and something way, way heavier that would just freak people out, be the heaviest band around. So we did that, and then other heavy bands came around, and then we saw all of a sudden that was the thing Heavy bands were just kind of not blasé, but so we wanted to make the shows crazier. So we moved around more on stage, and we wanted to we wanted it to be a visual impact as well as a sonic impact, and it kept stepping up in that regard. And we kept pushing ourselves, and it was not so much pushing ourselves against other bands as it was pushing ourselves with ourselves. And I think coming from a background where we crave like the adrenaline rush of the experience, from being a bunch of surfer guys. Um, we wanted to jump off guitar stacks, we wanted to crowd surf, we wanted to do all these impactful things and at some point in time that equated to what people considered to be a crazy live show. Yeah. So people came to see the crazy live show as much as they saw the music and you'd get people coming going, I've never heard you before but that was the mentalest thing I've ever seen. And then they might buy a record or you'd see them coming the next time even though they never listened to any other heavy band, they'd come because of the experience they got. And it wasn't necessarily, again, something that we've necessarily said, let's keep doing that, let's, let's keep that huge, crazy live show, but it's something we've been conscious of, yeah. knowing that that's part of what this band was always about. So I guess it grew in that regard. And it's just kind of snowballed, to be honest. Yeah, like it's become its, its own thing or something. Yeah, like there's, like, there was a, there's been a certain point where, um, I guess, people decided that they liked our music and our live show enough that um, I guess one of them you could take simply on the recording side of things and say I just love the music Parkway and you could also watch the show and say and it translates live and luckily we've been able to nail both and it's kind of worked around the world Mm -hmm. and the great and incredibly lucky timing thing that happened for us was MySpace Right, right? because you're talking about us starting a band, the first thing we ever did was record a demo, and the demo was a four track recording on a cassette, and it was the worst quality you've ever heard, and Graham will very much testify <laughs> to this. And um, literally like 20 of these with handwritten lyrics, and that was our music. And as soon as we had our first ever properly recorded EP, which was with another band called Like the Prom Queen, who gave us a split release, which was a massive leg up at that point in time. Um, MySpace came along and it was right when it was blowing up and we got to put this music online and all of a sudden you didn't even have to have a demo tape anymore. We had people all over the world saying, I like your music. Yeah, yeah. And it just spread like that. It was, it was really, really um, crazy in the way that social media kind of took over. And the whole concept of music being spread that way was really new. Before that it was Napster, I think. And that was kind of it. So MySpace took over right at the exact time when we started a proper release. And that gave us access to basically the world. Our first two tours overseas, we had releases, but they were so limited overseas that it was... um, I'm pretty sure you could say 99.9% of people that we played to overseas had never actually picked up an album of ours physically, but they had actually heard the band. Mm -hmm. So that means they got it completely offline. Yeah. So that meant that we were able to travel in, around the world and play a very dodgy European and American <laughs> tour, which lasted like five months of what most people would call hell on earth. But um, at the same time, we played, played gigs simply off the back of that. So, yeah. Seems like it would be reasonable to say that a lot of this stuff that we're talking about now, and we're going to move into questions for you guys now because we've only got five minutes left. So, um, Flying through it. On... on, on Oh, right, um. that's cool. Okay. Um, that's what I thought, anyway. <laughs> what? <laughs> Am I tripping? What? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think it seems like kind of what we're talking about for both artists is like seeing, is being kind of aware of your own interests and supporting that ambition, but also, and not kind of trying to be someone else or trying to match yes. someone else's career because mm-hmm. it's going to be very hard to do because everyone's kind of different, but then also noticing these opportunities as they exist and like intellectually recognizing them as opportunities, Mm. sort of trying to seat those Mm. opportunities when they're there to be had. Taking note of what works for other people is fantastic, 
<laughs> trying to be the other person never works. Mm -hmm. That's it. You have to be your own person full stop and your own band full stop. You, you, there's never going to be another one of those bands. You can't say, I'm going to be the next band, blah, because band blah already exists. If you, even if you are that good and you are exactly the same, you're just a copy. So there's no point in shooting for that. Any thoughts? I think just doing things like this as well. This is so cool that um, mm. to have things like this available and that you guys are all here, I think that's um, great. But, um, well, that's, I guess this is here for you. But just doing things like this and, um, and yeah, just networking is probably the biggest thing, I think, in this industry, you know, besides talent, the actual, yeah. you know, talent, I suppose. But, um, and it's not but that hard in Australia. Australia's not no, that big, so it's you so, can't meet people. With Facebook and Instagram even and Twitter and all of that mm. sort of stuff, it's so easy to, you know, and I guess it's um, like what you were saying before with your Instagram, like it's so... To even to talk to people that you know you might have 10 years ago it would have been impossible to chat to your favorite artist but now it's become so easy to do that with things like instagram you can directly send them know, a dick pic totally yeah. do that that's yeah. snapchat that that's you know Straight you away. might get one back i don't know it's happened before yeah so that's speaking of dick pics does anyone have anything they want to share with these guys <laughs> just ask them any questions oh about <laughs> This room is a weird sound vortex, so if you <laughs> uh, Hi, this one's for Winston. You probably already know. Um, I forgot the when, question. Though, so when okay. um, did Parkway and uh, why as well, did you decide you needed a manager? Okay, for us, it was kind of strange. Um, as, as I've described, the whole evolution of this band has been kind of weird. But um, Graham is our manager. He's also the owner of Resist Records, who we release our records through. And it's been that way as long as we can remember. We've never actually signed a contract with him. We've never signed a contract with the record label. Um, and it's been simply a friendship trust based thing. And that's mainly because it's worked. And I'm not saying don't go out and get a manager. Um, I'm literally saying that he has been there to do the work that we've not been able to do. The point in time when we needed a, an official person like managing us became the point, I think, when there was so much stuff going on that we couldn't physically control all of it. So we had to rely on someone we trusted to take control of the other things. Like our, our guitarist, Pig, still does a lot of business stuff. He mm -hmm. still books all our flights, handles a lot of merch, stuff like that. And Graz handles everything else that we can't handle. So. I think yeah. that was like an initially when we first, I guess, went from a label to a management sort of thing was when they were just touring so often that um, they couldn't, you know, you just can't do, it runs out of time, I guess, and they just needed someone to do it. And I was like, well, I'll do it. And then we've done, <laughs> done that for 10 years. So we're still doing things. So it's sort of, and it works. The, uh, the, uh, any advice I would give people is <coughs> it seems like, uh, I think, there's, Josh said it before, there was no, there's no checklist, there's no 20 things like we're a band, we've written songs, get a manager. Mm -hmm. Management is fantastic and Graz is invaluable, as is every other person that works with us. But um, the thing of most value, again, is control. And being able to know exactly what you're doing, confirming every show that you do personally. And also, if it comes to actually being financially successful in a band, every single person that you have on board you pay for their time and basically it comes down to time is money. If you're willing to put the effort in and basically do the work, be it booking flights for several hours or whatever, you will not have to pay another person hundreds of dollars to book some flights. So we've always been part of that model as well and we have a very tight group that runs this band, like a handful of people worldwide that runs, well, that's, runs yeah, the band. Same. We haven't changed a person in the whole structure of like our European agent, US agent, labels overseas. Not, well, there hasn't been a change in probably, I'd say, the, was it what, 10 years, 9 or 8 years? And that's Who's the change? Of, I can't even well, remember. There hasn't anymore. been a change. We haven't, so. we, yeah, we haven't, had it, we haven't had a change. And the only contract we ever signed was with Epitaph in the States because you literally, we, we had to do it. Yeah. And they're a good label, but that's the way they roll. So the rest of it comes down to working with people that we've trusted and working, that's it. Like it's, I think people get screwed when they sit back and think other people are gonna do things for them, basically. I know we're, uh, we're running really short of time, unfortunately, Sorry, so um, we might just take one more if that's okay. Uh, yep, just over here. Hello, 
Uh, so this is probably a question for more of like Parkway. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, Winston. Um, so in terms of like touring and funding and all that, did you guys receive any grants from like APRAMCOS or um, any like DFAT grants uh, that come out? And um, did they help you or will it I, start, did you get any? As far as I know, I don't think we did, but I think our guitarist did actually get one for a, for a record release he put out which involved Parkway songs. And that did actually help him quite a lot. And it was one of those things where he, I can remember him constantly saying, I've got to do a fair bit of work for this. And fill in paperwork and stuff. I'm more referring to like the DVD, like Homeways of Heartless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like again? I thought that for the Southeast Asia tour, you might have got like a little ah, bit of government right. funding. No, no, no. No, we, we never actually did. We, oh, okay. we've, we funded everything ourselves, and it's been one of those things of um, if there's a project coming up, we saved. And every single cent that anyone has given us has supported the band in some way, shape, or form. Like our revenue is the band, and it's never come from grants outside, so yeah. It was, must be the t-shirts the kids are bought. So. <laughs> I'm dead, dead serious when I say that. <laughs> well, Leanne was just saying that there is the opportunity to do the Austrade dollar for dollar. Well, that that one of my other... Well, no, I manage a band called The Medics, um, which is an alternative rock band. But they were from regional Australia, from Cairns. Mm. Um, and without the right grant at the right time to fund their first record, that band wouldn't exist. And mm. I think it's a genre thing too. You can yeah. do those hard yards touring, but sometimes that's financially really difficult. hundred percent. Yeah, like we live in, we, we, we come from a background where touring that op, that often is an option and yeah. it's not necessarily It's really option. tough yeah. in a lot of, it's particularly rock that's not in that part yeah. of the spectrum. Well, you, mm. It's yeah, incredibly it, hard. It well, there are grants available and so I think if there are grants, we've never gotten a grant either though. I've been t yeah, but, it's been strategic. Though. Yeah, but you know, um, if they're, if you, if they're available and to you then yeah, absolutely. It's about strategy in the right time, right? You know, every band's got its own. If, yeah. you, if you have the time to get to apply for a grant... It's really there's hard to apply for a grant too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, can be, it can be a lot of work, but um, my um, cousin actually works for the Arts Council and she has literally said so many times, anytime you guys need a grant or something, just come to us because they are... So that's just are. like totally illegal, but that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, 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 basically, she's basically just... When you're willing to us. manipulate the but system to your up. own advantage, and I think that, yeah. that shows <laughs> real gumption. But there is... Like, it's, there's no... There's no um, nothing to be lost from trying. Except for your situations. freedom, of course. Yeah. <laughs> because what you did was illegal. Yeah. Uh, we've got time for one more, just uh, whoever it is over here. Um, just for Winston, um, I was just going to ask, to what do you attribute the, um, the unique fan base for hardcore um, rock these days? Like you were saying before, you had a lot of support from your fans. And yeah. Why do you think that's more or different um, or just of a different type? Jeez, um, where do we start with that one? Um, again, it's, it's different. I think it's different, different for Parkway because it's... It's been one of those things where somehow we kind of slipped outside of our genre sound when it came to the audience. The, the, the people coming to the audience definitely don't see it at a local hardcore gig. And there were the gigs that we were going to where there's like a handful of people and then all of a sudden you play to several thousand and you, you see it as being the same type of music. But um, for me, when it came to the, comes to the loyalty of the, the fan base, I, I grew up with this kind of music and it was an outlet for me and it was a... A, a place where I definitely didn't feel like the most socially acceptable person and yet I went there to these shows and I fit in with a bunch of people who didn't fit in. So when you're dealing with, um, I guess, a social group that all come from that mentality, they're definitely going to champion and stand behind music that represents them with everything they've got because it works hand in hand. It's the soundtrack to, I guess, them being outcasts. And the thing is, I, I still feel like that. So I. I don't mind, it's just, I guess, one of those things where the music goes with the people and vice versa, and especially when you, you, you're coming from a background where the music doesn't have that set barrier of rock god playing music up here, fans down there, like, the two don't mesh worlds. And w I've just gone from being the person there to the person standing over here with the microphone. That's been the only difference. I haven't walked up a golden staircase and now I'm totally untouchable. So, yeah. Well, I'd like to uh, wrap it up because unfortunately we really are out of time. I guess if you have any other questions, probably ask the artists while they're just walking off stage. You can really annoy them. They'll be trying to get to the guitars because <laughs> they ultimately hate their fans. 
Um, but please give them a big round of applause. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Right. Cool.